appropriate hymn for today's lesson. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you thanking you that love lifted me. Amen. Love lifted each, each and every one of us. And we know love as your son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We were going down deep into our sin, but you saved us, Father God, so we thank you. We thank you that when we repented, you no longer see us in our sin, but you see the blood that covers us. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for our Lord and our Savior. As we study this lesson today, we ask that you open up our minds and that you strengthen us so that we can go out and do your work. We ask these and all other blessings in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior's name. Amen. 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 Today's Sunday School lesson for June the 27th, lesson topic is an amazing feat. Scriptures would be Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, and the background scriptures are the same. We will go straight into our lesson today. I'll start with Matthew chapter 14 and read verses 22 through 23, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, which says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. We learn about the this and immediately after this from John chapter 6, verse 1 through 14, which tells us, after this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon's Peter brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Mm -hmm. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. Those scriptures were John chapter six, verses one through 14. As soon as the crowd had been fed and the disciples had picked up the scraps, Jesus immediately got his disciples and the crowd moving. The crowd was ready to crown Jesus as king. The Lord knew their motives, he knew that their motives were not spiritual and that their purposes were out of God's will. Yeah. The crowd wanted a king that would overthrow Rome. Mm -hmm. They did not see the bigger picture of Jesus reconciling his people back to God. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the crowd could not make Jesus king. That was in God's hand. Mm -hmm. If the disciples had stayed, they would have certainly have fallen in the plans and with the plans for the crowd. For the disciples also did not fully understand Jesus Christ's plans. The disciples would have surely been caught up in the excitement and probably trying to figure out what positions they would have in Jesus' kingdom. They were still thinking of a national and a political kingdom and not of a spiritual kingdom. Mm -hmm. Many in the crowd did not think about what Jesus said about goodness and judgment. All they wanted was the miracles. Yeah. John 6, verse 26 through 27 tells us, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. 
spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. That was John chapter 6, verse 26 through 27. Following the crowd or listening to the crowd or seeking the crowd's praise is not what a Christian should be about. Amen. Matthew 4, verse 8 through 10 tells us, Next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I would give it all to you, he said, if you would kneel down and worship me. Yeah. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scripture says, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Mm -hmm. Satan tried to offer Jesus the world's kingdom and glory in exchange for his worship. Uh -huh. He still tries to offer us the crowd adulation in exchange for submission to him. Mm -hmm. Let's skip church today and hang out with the boys and watch the sporting event. There's an early bird sale from 10 to 12 this Sunday only. We have to get there early to beat the crowds. Israel repeatedly renounced loyalty to God in favor of foreign gods for the sake of political advantage or monetary prosperity. Yet, Jesus refuses to carry out his divine mission according to the principle of the world. His mission is not determined by any popular expectation or any of what the human crowd wants. Remember, the crowd welcomed Jesus when he entered Jerusalem, and later that week, the crowd shouted, crucify him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To prevent the disciples from being caught up, Jesus sent the people home and sent the disciples away to the other side of the lake. John 6 and 15 tells us, when Jesus saw they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the pills by himself. Uh -huh. And Matthew 14 and 23 tells us that he went to the hills to pray. The Jewish timeline of these events would be the first evening, which would be from 3 to 6 p.m. That was when Jesus fed the crowd. The second evening would be from 6 to 9, when Jesus went to the hill to pray. The third evening was from 9 to 12, and the fourth evening was from 3 to 6 a.m. And Jesus is still praying. Amen. First Thessalonians 5 and 17 tells us, never stop praying. There are times when long prayer sessions are needed. Amen. Jesus is teaching us on how we as Christians should handle temptations by praying and persisting in prayer. Yeah. To persist in prayer means keeping one's request constantly before God, believing that God will answer. Amen. This is how we celebrate victory over temptation, by praying. Amen. The lesson topic is an amazing feat. And while we will discuss the amazing feat of Jesus walking on the water, what's more amazing is his prayer life. Amen. In the midst of Jesus' great ministry to others, he never neglected prayer. Mm. If Jesus Christ found it needful and advantageous to pray, how much more must it be for us also to pray? Amen. Amen. Verse 24 through 27 of our lesson tells us, Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. Mm -hmm. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. Amen. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. Mm -hmm. In their fear, they cried out, it is a ghost, it's a ghost. Yeah. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said, mm -hmm. take courage, I am here. Amen. Meanwhile, we leave the mountain and go back to the Sea of Galilee. A storm arose while they were crossing the lake. They were being tossed, the disciples were being tossed to and fro with the waves, and the wind also is contrary. Mark, at, Mark adds that they were distressed in their rowing. John tells us not only was the wind contrary, but John 6 and 18 says it was a fierce wind. Yeah. In other words, it was a bad night to be on the lake. The wind is normally a sailor's friend, but now it was the disciples' greatest enemy. Life has a way of turning things around for us. Mm -hmm. Things that should be an asset can quickly become a liability. Yes. Mm -hmm. So here we have the disciples trying to be obedient, but they are not having much success. It is dark and gloomy, and the storm is violent. The water is angry, and worst of all, there is no Jesus. Amen. The storm arose while the disciples were doing their best to be obedient. 
They were doing exactly what Jesus had told them to do. But the storm still came. It would have been so easy for them to turn around and go back, gone with the wind, back to where they came from. But instead of that, they continued to pursue the direction that the Lord had told them to go. Amen. So we find them in the midst of the storm, but we also find them in the midst of obedience. Amen. When believers are in the place of obedience to Christ, they are in the place of safety, no matter what the circumstances. Yes, Christ knew, knew that the storm was coming. Yes, he directed them into the storm. But they were safer in the God in the storm in God's will than on land with the crowd out of God's will. All right. The place of security is not often the place of favorable circumstance. The place of security is the place of obedience to God's will. Yeah. 1 Samuel 15 and 22 says, But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, Amen. and submission is better than offering the fat of the rams. Uh -huh. Matthew 5 and 45 tells us, In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. In other words, everybody has had <coughs> storms in their lives. Uh -huh. Some storms are caused by us. For example, Jonah deliberately disobeyed God and encountered a storm when God sent a great wind while Jonah was on the boat. Right. Ananias and Sapphira deliberately lied to the church and to God concerning their giving. And Acts 5 tells how they encountered a storm and lost their lives. Amen. Some storms come because we willingly, willingly disobey God's light. But then, again, some storms come because we are in God's will. For example, Job 1, verse 6 through 22 tells us, One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Yeah. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Mm. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. Yeah. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Amen. Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. Mm -hmm. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. Mm -hmm. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. Amen. So Satan left the Lord's presence. One day when Job's son and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabins raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughter were feasting in their older brother's, oldest brother's home. Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed, and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Amen. The story of Job is a perfect example of a storm, multiple storms, coming because we are in God's will. Yes. We know that when Satan came to God concerning what was happening on earth, God challenged him saying, 
I want you to look at Job. He is a perfect man. Job was faithful. He was a perfect man in God's sight. And he was going through the storm of his life. Yeah. When we are doing God's will, when we are in the very center of what God wants for us, the storms may still come. Uh -huh. Some st storms come because we are in God's will. Yeah. Just, be Amen. just because you are encountering a storm in your life does not mean that you are out of the will of God. Uh -huh. Just because you are having difficulties in your life does not mean that you are willingly disobeying, will, willfully disobeying him. Uh -huh. You can obey God, walking in all the light you could possibly have, right in the center of God's will, uh -huh. and at that same time, encounter a terrible storm in your life. Yeah. The point is, that sometimes God will send us a storm of testing. And at the same time, he is delivering us from a storm of temptation. Amen. The disciples may have been scared to death, but in the end, they realized they went through this storm not because they were out of God's will, yes. but because they were in his yeah. will. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The last time the disciples got a storm like this, Jesus was in the back of the boat, and all, he, all they had to do was wake him up and have him to stop the storm, mm -hmm. which he did. Matthew 8, verse 23 through 27 tells us that then Jesus got into the boat and started to cross the lake with his disciples. Uh -huh. Suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. Uh -huh. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, shouting, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Uh -huh. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? Mm -hmm. You have so little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Uh -huh. But now Jesus isn't with them. Uh -huh. To make it even worse, he can't get there because they took the only boat. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they had taken the only boat and they had no Jesus. Yeah. And they know that Jesus isn't going to come because there isn't any way to, for him to get there. But all the while, they're in the middle of the sea, going through all of this entire trauma. Amen. Jesus is on the hill praying for them. Yeah. Amen. It's wonderful to have your pastor or ministers pray for you. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to have a prayer partner pray for you. Uh -huh. It's wonderful to, wonderful to have a family member pray for you. Mm -hmm. It's even wonderful to have the church pray for you. Yeah. But you know what the good news is? <laughs> The good news is, if you're walking through the toughest time of your life, Jesus is praying for you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hebrew 4, verse 14 through 16 tells us, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he has faced all the same tests as we do. Yet, he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Amen. Hebrews says that Jesus intercedes for us in our time of needs. As we are here on earth encountering storms in our life, our Lord is on the right hand, at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Yeah. He's interceding Thank for you. God. He's caring for you. He's mm -hmm. taking your need to the Father. Mm -hmm. He knows all about your needs because he's been there. He has walked where we walk. He mm -hmm. feels what we feel. He knows how it feels to be lonely when you need someone. Mm -hmm. He has heard the same derogatory names that people call us. And he goes to the Father and he intercedes for us during our storms. Amen. While we are being beaten down, battered, tormented, tortured, tossed by the storm, Jesus is interceding on our behalf in the Father's presence. Jesus came to this world to talk to us about God, and now he is in heaven talking to God about us. The disciples didn't know it, but they're safe and secure. For five or six hours, they've been at it, rowing, struggling, rowing, for trying to go more than five, four miles with no success. But isn't it comforting to know that Jesus knows Amen. Yeah, yeah. Jesus knew of their situation long before it happened mm -hmm. and he did not have to rush away from prayer in order to be there on time to help yeah. uh -huh. 
our timing is not God's timing. That's right. But he is always an on-time God. Yeah. Yeah. The storms and the disciples were equally in his hands, and he knew in advance exactly what he would do with both. Mm -hmm. The disciples were obedient in following Jesus' command to depart. So when have you seen the Lord forget about or turn from someone being obedient to his commands? Yeah. Yeah. Psalms 9 and 9 says, The Lord is a shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Yes, yes. Psalms 18 and 2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. Mm -hmm. Psalms 23 and 4, Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Uh -huh. And Psalms 139, verse 8 through 10 tells us, If I go up to heaven, you are there. Uh -huh. If I go down to the grave, you are there. Uh -huh. If I ride, ride the wings of the morning, uh -huh. if I dwell by the farthest ocean, yeah. even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Yeah. Yeah. The disciples had seemingly forgot about these scriptures, just like we do when we face right. situations beyond our own individual resources. Yeah. The disciples had even forgotten Jesus' own words in Matthew 6 and 32, which says, These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Uh -huh. Matthew 10, verse 29 through 30 mm -hmm. says, What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. Mm -hmm. And the very hairs of your head on your on your head are all numbered. Mm -hmm. All the disciples could think about was their danger, and all they could feel was fear. Mm -hmm. But Jesus had not forgotten about the disciples, and he came to them through the very danger that threatened to destroy them, mm -hmm. walking on the sea. Yeah. He used their trial as his footpath. Mm. The disciples could not physically see Jesus on the mountain or through the stormy darkness, mm -hmm. but Jesus knew exactly where the disciples were. Amen. The previous storm had been during the daytime, but this storm was at night. Mm. The disciples will learn, just like us, that Jesus' power is not limited to day or night, mm -hmm. or when he is with them or when he is away. Mm -hmm. Jesus' power is not limited. Walking on the sea means our Lord has power over gravity and authority over creation. Uh -huh. Men are not naturally able to walk on water. The laws of gravity just simply won't allow us to walk on water. Uh -huh. But mm -hmm. Jesus is no mere man. Yeah. He is God incarnate. Yeah. The one who created the water now walks upon it with complete control. Mm -hmm. The water that the disciples feared was under his control. The waves that were over their heads was under his feet. Yeah. And it does not matter what storm you are going through, financial storms, family storms, emotional storms, mm -hmm. physical storms, Jesus is on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. He knew where to walk. He knew exactly where they were. Uh -huh. Mark tells us that Jesus saw them, Mark 6 and 48. It did not matter that they could not see him. In life difficulties, we sometimes lose sight of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The disciples are on the sea where it is impossible to see the Lord. But Jesus was on the mountain above them and never lost sight of them. Mm -hmm. Psalms 139 verse 6 to 12 says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest ocean, even if there your hands will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask all the, dark, all the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Amen. Darkness is no barrier. Distance is no barrier to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He knows everything. Proverbs 15 and 3 says, The Lord is watching everywhere, keeping his eyes on both the evil and the good. He knows you're sitting down. He knows you're rising up. 
He knows everything there is to know about you, where you are and what your needs are. It does not matter where you are. He knows because he knows everything. He knows where we are. He knows our distresses. He knows our circumstances. And he knows how to get to us. Jesus could have just turned around on the top of the mountain and hushed the storm or made sure that it never started. But he ran them out to their, the disciples out to their limits so that they could learn that in that limit, he is still there. He not only came in the storm, but he came on the storm. There is nothing that can prevent Christ from coming to his own in their time of need. Amen. Romans 8, verse 31 through 39 tells us, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can be, ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us from whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Uh -huh. Who then will condemn us? Mm -hmm. No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised yeah. to life for us. Yeah. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Mm -hmm. Can anything ever, separ ever separate us from Christ's love? Mm -hmm. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted mm -hmm. or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scripture says, for your sake we are killed every day. Uh -huh. We are being slaughtered like sheep. Mm -hmm. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Amen. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Yeah. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Amen. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Hebrews verse 13, 5b tells us, For God has said, I will never fail you, I will never abandon you. Mm -hmm. We should not turn back when storms arise, no matter how terrible the trials. Do you realize that if you had never been in a storm, you would never know how to handle the storm? Mm -hmm. Verse 26 says the disciples were terrified when they saw Jesus. Mark adds they all saw him. So it wasn't just one disciple seeing him. They all saw him. At this point, they are terror stricken. I mean, it was bad enough to be in the situation that they were in, in the middle of a storm. They were physically exhausted, having struggled against that storm for hours. And suddenly, out of nowhere, they saw a figure which they thought was a ghost walking mm -hmm. on the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were frightened, just like yeah. you probably would be too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Both yeah. Going in the shop, yeah. thinking that they had seen the death angel yeah. or a premonition of death at their hand. Mm -hmm. Why would they think it was a ghost? Because they were living in fear yeah. instead of living by faith. Yeah. Yeah. Faith would have assumed it was Christ. Uh -huh. But since they couldn't see him, they didn't believe. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for, for it is the evidence of things that we yeah. cannot see. Uh -huh. They needed to learn that faith in, is believing in something that you cannot see. Uh -huh. But then Jesus spoke to them. Uh -huh. Don't be afraid, he yeah. said. Take courage, I am here. Yeah. 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 This is the lesson for the 12 disciples, and it's the lesson for us also. Yeah. There is no reason for fear in your life as a Christian. Mm. There's no reason to have anxiety or be upset. No mm. matter how severe the storm or how, how hopeless it looks. Mm. Jesus, Jesus just comes along and so straightforwardly says, cheer up, I am yeah. here. Yeah. He does not give you, them some great speech or some, some great theological description or explain to them how you can walk on water. This lesson is not about how to teach people how to walk on water. Yeah. This is to teach yeah. people who can't walk on water yeah. that God can. Yeah. 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 
The Lord's purpose was to demonstrate his love and willingness to do whatever is necessary to rescue his children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He did not have to walk on water to save them, but his doing so gave them an unforgettable reminder of the power and extent of his divine protection. Yeah. We will never find ourselves in a place where Christ cannot find us. Amen. And no storm is too severe for him to save us from it. That's right. He protects his own, whom he will never fail nor forsake. Yeah. The lesson for the disciples is the lesson for us. There is no reason for God's people to fear. Amen. There is no reason for anxiety, no matter how hopeless and threatening our problems seem to be. Life is stormy. We know that. It is painful. We know that. Yeah. There are hurts, wounds, and some of us suffer more than others. Uh -huh. But the great confidence of this passage is that you are never away from the authority, uh -huh. knowledge, or protective care uh -huh. of the Savior. Yeah. The storm uh -huh. is never so severe, the night is never so dark, uh -huh. and the boat is never so frail that we risk danger beyond our Father's care. Yeah. Yeah. We need to know that because that takes away our fear. Mm -hmm. What is it to fear? He is either in the mountain interceding with the Father on our behalf, mm -hmm. or he is on the sea walking to us. Mm -hmm. Either way, yeah. we are secure. Uh -huh. We are secure in his prayers, in his yeah. powers, yeah. and in his Thank protection. You. Yeah. If you. you are a Christian, you have no reason for fear, mm -hmm. but only faith in knowing that Jesus is there mm -hmm. and he is able. Yeah. Thank you, God. The next part of our lesson is Matthew 14, verses 28 through 31. And it says, Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. Walking on, tell me to come to you. Walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sing. Uh -huh. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Mm -hmm. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Mm -hmm. You have so little faith, Jesus oh. said. Why did you doubt me? Mm -hmm. We all know the story. We know that Peter is going to walk on the water, uh -huh. and we know that he's going to fail. Mm -hmm. But we can say this much for Peter. He got out of the boat. Yeah. Uh -huh. The rest of the disciples yeah. were still there consumed with fear. Uh -huh. yeah. Anyone can sit in the boat and watch, right. but it takes a person, a person of some faith to leave the boat and walk on water. Yeah. Yeah. Peter stepped out on faith, and whether he failed or not, he did do the impossible. Yeah. Remember yeah. that the storm did not start when Peter stepped out of the boat. The storm was already raging yeah. when Peter stepped onto the water. Uh -huh. So with the winds blowing and the waves crashing, crashing, Peter walked on the water to go yeah. to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Peter is walking in victory because of Christ's power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The key to this whole amazing feat is the fact that in the beginning, Peter had his eyes on Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. If you are going to walk in Christ, yeah. if you're going to accomplish anything for Jesus, yeah. Yeah. then you must keep your eyes on him. Yeah. Yeah. We will yeah. never have success in the Christian life if we do not have a Christ-centered focus. Uh -huh. We will never have success as a church mm -hmm. unless we have a Christ-centered focus. Uh -huh. when, mm -hmm. when we lose sight of Jesus, we will do just as Peter did. Uh -huh. We will sing. Yes. Uh -huh. In the ship, ship, Peter was totally focused on Jesus and getting to him. Mm -hmm. yeah. That had been Peter's goal all along. Mm -hmm. Peter's goal was not to walk on the water. His goal was to get to Jesus. Yeah. Outside the ship, Peter saw the wind boisterous. He also was afraid. Peter's undeveloped faith feared the storm more than the Lord. The result was that he began to sink. Unbelief puts our circumstances between us and God. But faith put God's between, put God's between us and our circumstances. Again, unbelief put our circumstances between us and God. But faith put God between us and our circumstances. Peter could believe God until he saw the wind and until he saw the storm. And when he knew that there was no human way to conquer that problem, he ran out of faith. Faith is the ability to believe God when there is no human resources. Faith moves mountains. 
Faith accomplishes yeah. great things. Yeah. It was faith in God's power that caused Caleb, the Jew Jewish spy, to look at the land of Canaan with his giants and say in Numbers 13 and 30b, let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. That was faith in God's power. It was faith in God's care that enabled Job to say in the midst of his personal storms, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Uh -huh. it, it was faith in God's protection that enabled Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to stand on the edge of the fiery furnace and say, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. It was also faith in God's word that enabled Daniel to survive the lion's den. As it says in Daniel 6, verse 16 through 23. So at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the dens of lions. The king said to him, may your God whom you serve so faithfully rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Mm -hmm. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. Mm -hmm. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. All right. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the yeah. lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, yeah. was your God whom you serve so faithfully mm -hmm. able to rescue you from the lions. Mm -hmm. Daniel answered, long live the king. <laughs> My God sent his angels to shut the lions' mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted, lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. It was faith that saved that sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped them with her hairs of her head. Yeah. Luke 7, verse 41 through 50 says, Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Right. Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I came, first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. But she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that go, he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Yeah, Go exactly. in peace. Mm -hmm. And as we also look at the faith chapter in Hebrews, we will read Hebrews 11, verse 1 through chapter 12, verse 2. All right. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for, for mm -hmm. it is the evidence of things we cannot see. Mm -hmm. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, uh -huh. that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was faith that Abel brought, Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Mm -hmm. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gift. Mm -hmm. Although Abel is long dead, he mm -hmm. still speaks to us by his example of faith. Yeah. It was by faith that Enoch when it was taken to, up to heaven without dying. Mm -hmm. He disappeared because God took him. Yeah. Right. For before he, he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. Mm -hmm. right. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Right. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Mm -hmm. It was by faith that Noah built a large ark 
large boat to save his family from the flood. Uh -huh. He obeyed God right. who warned him about the things that had never happened before. Mm -hmm. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. Mm -hmm. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that mm -hmm. God would give him as his inheritance. Mm -hmm. He went without knowing where he was going and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. Mm -hmm. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Mm. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Mm -hmm. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, mm -hmm. though she was barren and was too old. Mm -hmm. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation comes from this one man who was good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore, there is no way to count them. Mm. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. Yeah. They did yeah. not receive what was promised, mm. but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. Yeah. Mm. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country that they can call their own. Mm -hmm. If they longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. Mm -hmm. But they were looking for a better place, mm -hmm. a heavenly homeland. Mm -hmm. That's why, that is why God is not ashamed to be called their God. Mm -hmm. For he has prepared a city for them. Mm -hmm. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Yeah. Abraham, who received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, mm -hmm. Isaac. Amen. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Mm -hmm. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. Yeah. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Yeah. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessing for the future to his son Jacob and Esau. Mm -hmm. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. Yeah. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. Mm -hmm. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. Uh -huh. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. Uh -huh. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. Uh -huh. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Uh -huh. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn son. Yeah. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. Mm -hmm. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. Yeah. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days yeah. and the walls came crashing down. Amen. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God. Amen. For she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. Yeah. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. Amen. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched Amen. the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. Mm. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Mm. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half and mm. others were killed with the sword. Mm. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. 
They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Amen. Yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind for us, mm -hmm. so that they would not reach perfection without us. Amen. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, mm -hmm. let us strip off every weight that slows us down, right. especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Yeah. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, oh, the yeah. champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Mm -hmm. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding this shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside yeah. God's throne. Amen. 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 The difference between walking on water and sinking in despair is in our eyes. Yeah. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, yeah. we are able to walk on water. Yeah. Uh -huh. Peter took his eyes off the one who sustained him and focused on the difficulties around him. Yeah. When we start looking at our circumstances, our situations, or our storms in life, we too lose faith and will yeah. sink. Yeah. That's right. In that moment of terror, Peter called out the most basic expression of faith possible. Lord, save me. Amen. Lord, save me indicates three very important truths that we should never forget. Mm -hmm. right. One, it indicates that Peter knew he was sinking. Uh -huh. This may seem like it's a logical conclusion, it but right. it is one that so many today are totally ignoring. Mm -hmm. There are so many today that are sinking. Yeah. And instead of just saying, Lord, save me, Lord, they continue me. to sink. Amen. The power of Christ to help us and save us from sin and ourselves is only beneficial when we acknowledge that we need saving. Uh -huh. yeah. Second, it indicates Peter knew the one who had authority over every situation. Uh -huh. Peter addressed Christ as Lord, meaning master owner. Uh -huh. Peter acknowledged and recognized Christ as the master of the sea and the owner of the water, uh -huh. the controller of all circumstances. There is no pride in Peter's heart now or dependence on himself. Peter is totally dependent on God. Amen. Third, short prayers are effective. Yes. Amen. Lord, save me is effective. Yes. Yes. Next part of our verses, the last part of our verses is Matthew chapter 14, verses 32 to 33. Right. When they climb back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worship him. You really are the son of God, they explain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The most spectacular miracle was accomplished without Jesus saying a word or raising a hand. Mm -hmm. The moment he and Peter got into the boat with the other disciples, the wind stopped. Mm -hmm. John 6 and 21 says, Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately mm -hmm. they arrived at their destination. Mm -hmm. They had been three to four miles out in the sea, and the storm was raging as fiercely as ever. But in an instant, that same instant that Jesus got into the boat, it stopped and the boat was at its yeah. destination. Uh -huh. When Jesus first calmed the storm, the disciples says, what manner of man is this? Mm -hmm. But now their clear testimony was, thou art the son of God. Yeah. Verse 33 is the first time that they have ever said that. Mm -hmm. The father said it at the baptism, the demon said it on the eastern shore of the sea, but the disciples had never said it before. They have seen miracle upon miracle upon miracle, raising the dead, casting out demons. They had heard preaching and teaching, and they had been hearing it for more over two years. They responded differently, though, to the storm and Christ's miraculous power to calm it than they did to any of the to the miracle of the feeding of the five thousand. Mark tells us in Mark six and fifty two, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. But now they are led to worship Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. If you look at the New Testament, you will see the mark of worship of Christ. Looking in the Gospels, for example, we find the wise men worshiping um, Christ. We find the leper worshiping him. We find the Gentiles worshiping him. We find a Canaanite woman worshiping him. We find a maniac out of the tombs worshiping him. We find a blind man worshiping him. 
In John 9, we find the disciples worshiping him at his resurrection and again in the mountain in Matthew 28, yeah. and then worshiping him at his ascension in Luke 24. Mm -hmm. If we look at the epistle, we find in Hebrews 1 that all the God, angels of God worship him. In Philippians, we find that God demands that every creature on the earth, over the earth, and under the earth bow the knee to worship Jesus Christ. Yeah. If we go all the way to Revelations, we find him being worshipped by all those in glory in chapter yeah. 4, 5, 11, and 19. Uh -huh. When John in Revelations fell down to worship an angel, the angel said, Get up, for I am only a creature as you are. Worship God. And yet, when Jesus was worshipped, never did he say, Get up, for I am a creature as you are. He accepted it. They yeah. worshiped him in verse 33 because it was clear to them that they had a right to do that because he is the son of God. Yeah. Yeah. So the message that sweeps its way through the gospel, the epistles, and the revelation of the New Testament is that Jesus Christ is to be worshiped. Yeah. 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 This concludes our lesson for today. May the Lord watch me and thee while we absent one from another. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.